That's actually not why I wanted you up here. <laughs> the reason why I wanted you up here is because I always think of the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And there's it's two hadiths actually. I won't quote either one of them because they're lengthy, but just the idea of both of them. Where he said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in one the first hadith Majtama Kaumun fi baitin min buyutillah yet luna kitab Allahi wa yatadarasunahu bainahum that there's no group of people that gather in one of the houses of the houses of Allah, meaning a masjid. Reciting the book of Allah and studying it amongst each other. Its meanings, its stories. Illa ghashiyatuhumur rahma, Except that the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surrounds them with mercy. And the angels descend upon them. And tranquility descends upon that gathering. That's why the gatherings of the masjid, they have that unique tranquility. They have that unique feeling. Because you're doing what you were made to do. What you're created to do. You're recharging to your purpose. So that offers you a level of tranquility and peace and happiness that's not matched by anything else. It's a connection to your purpose. So he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the angels descend upon them, tranquility and mercy surrounds them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them in his presence to the angels. So it's nothing praiseworthy. It's nothing impressive for the slave to mention the master by his nature by being a slave he must mention the master he must praise the master he must all the the the, the bounty and the blessings go back to the master it's only natural but for the master to mention the slave in praise that's special needs nothing right and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does that for us another hadith that's lengthier the prophet Muhammad said inna lillahi malaika Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has special angels that are tasked with what Searching the land for masajid, for gatherings of zikr, for people sitting together in circles, reciting the book of Allah and speaking about its meaning. People like us, inshallah, gatherings like this. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when one of them comes across such a gathering, they say, Halumma ila hajatikum. Come, we found what you're looking for. We found it. And they all rush to the masjid. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the way that the people sit in a circle, they envelop them in their own angelic circle. But there's more angels than people. So they go up and extends to the heavens. Can you imagine that there's a straight line upstairs as far as the eye can see and even further? Of angels proud of where you are, excited to be with you, wanting to be a part of this. So come closer, enjoy it. And then the hadith goes on. It's a lengthy hadith, how they, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala questions them. Why are these people here? What are they looking for? And the angels say, they're seeking your mercy, right? They're learning about you. They're seeking protection from your hellfire. They're seeking your jannah. They're obeying you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and each of these is a, is a lengthier conversation. You could check out the hadith in your own leisure. But with each of these questions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala follows up with more questions. They're seeking my jannah. Have they seen it? No. What if they saw it? The angels say they'd want it even more. What are they afraid of? Your hellfire. Have they seen it? The angels say no. What if they saw it? Then they would be even more afraid of it. What are they doing? Mentioning me. Obeying, mentioning you. Obeying you. Did they see me? They say no. What if they saw me? The angels say then they'd be even more eager to obey you. Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying all this? He knows it already. Doesn't Allah know this? The hadith says that. He says, He's asking them while he already knows better. So the hadith, the Prophet is telling us, Allah is asking the angels, and he already knows the answer. He knows better than the angels who are here witnessing this gathering. So what's the purpose? It's for me and you to hear it later. For Rasulullah to have said these words almost 1500 years ago, and it reaching you today, so you can keep coming back to the masjid. So you can keep seeking this out. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the angels, you are my witnesses, they'll have everything that they ask for, and they'll be protected from everything they're afraid of, and everything will be A-OK. -okay. So the angels, they don't like that. They complain about this guy. Not him, he's just, I'm just pointing randomly. Right, people who have been here before knows that it's, it's nothing personal. They say that, they say, what about that guy? And they point to someone. And they say, that guy is only here to see his friend Nadim. Nadim owes him five dollars. He's just here to collect. He has nothing to do with everything we just spoke about. The angels say that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا بهم جليسهم. There's no one who will sit in that gathering and be disappointed. There's no one who will be present with the rest of them and miss out. I refuse. So who's putting the most into this gathering? 
It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the most appreciative of it. He's noticing every single person in here. And he's putting more into it than any single one of us here. SubhanAllah. Because he wants it more for you than you do want it for yourself. All you have to do is keep coming back. Now I apologize for the length of the introduction. Even though I fully plan to make it that long. Would you accept such an apology from me? After admitting that I was not really sincere? Say it again, brother. Don't think about you? No need to apologize. Why? You forgive me regardless. Even though I just told you the whole apology was fake. Like I'm not, so I'm not really sorry for this introduction. I actually planned for it this, this long. Because you like me, right? It's because my, it's my personal charisma. Is that what's giving me a pass? It's the hadith that, it's the reason. So it's the information, if it could have gone longer, you're fine. So what, what's your rubric for apologies now? now? Now I'm interested, let's put a pause. What's your rubric for apologies? What would have made you reject this apology? If it was not beneficial? Okay. Hmm? Not, what makes it not sincere? How do you know my intention? Okay, so I'm saying what would make you reject my apology? Not this one in particular, but in general now. Not, not about what I just did, because it's not really a big deal. Everyone, everyone's cool with it. It's nothing to apologize for. But that, it's a nice segue into the idea of apologies, because the story is about an apology, really. So what makes you reject an apology? The tone? So the tone shows how the person feels. So what feeling do you sense from the person that would make you say, no, he's not sorry, or she's not sorry? Arrogance, okay? Excellent. We, if, if, if I, so just like this example here, I came in here with a five minute intro prepped. So that apology that I gave was more of a formality. I'm not really sorry, because I re fully knew that was gonna be that length. Um, so the fact that I'm knowingly doing what I'm doing would probably make you not believe that I'm sorry. So for example, if me, 32 years old, I come behind you and I flick your ears and I say, my bad, just kidding. You'll probably say, no, you're not. And you're way too old for this and you need help, <laughs> right? It wouldn't be cool because you know I know better. So that's one thing when you know that someone knows better. What if um, I've been flicking your ears for weeks and then I find out that you're my dentist. So I come up to you. I got really bad root canal pending, right? And I'm sitting in the chair and I say, hey man, remember for weeks in Jum'ah that was me? I'm really sorry. Would you take that? You wouldn't give me anesthesia. Oh wow, he's, he's going for blood. <laughs> Don't go to this guy. What's wrong with that apology? I, I'm, I, it's, it's, it's purely out of self-preservation. You know it's not about the mistake, it's not about me, it's not about you, it's, it's just about I have a need or some harm that I'm trying to avert, so I'm sorry. We naturally reject these things and we detect them. So the tone is indicative of how the person feels. If they don't feel sorry that they'll do it again, for example, or that they're just saying, we tend to reject these. So I want you to keep that in mind, how you look at apologies and the criteria through which you accept or reject them. This story was mentioned by Ibn Qudama and a bunch of others. It's not an authentic hadith, but you'll find it in a lot of books of the heart softeners and reminders. And he mentions a story of Bani Israel. He says, وَرُوِيَ أَنَّهُ لَحِقَ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ قَحْتٌ عَلَىٰ عَهْدِ مُوسَىٰ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ فَاجْتَمَعَ النَّاسُ إِلَيْهِ فَقَالُوا يَا كَلِمَ اللَّهِ اُدْعُ لَنَا رَبَّكَ أَنْ يَسْقِيَنَا الْغَيْثِ فَقَامَ مَعَهُمْ وَخَرَجُوا إِلَى الصحراء. In the time of Musa alayhi salam, after their salvation in Egypt from Pharaoh, he exits Egypt. And the tafsir mentions that their numbers were close to 200,000 people. Exiting this land that was just taken in punishment by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and heading to the holy land of Palestine. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them relief and justice and victory. Allahumma ameen. And in this process while they're heading on this journey as Allah commanded, they are afflicted by a severe drought. So they come to Musa alayhi salam and say, Oh Musa, Allah has given you a special status. Call upon Allah so that he can grant us water. So they exit, numbering from 70 to 200,000 people. 
And Musa Islam gathers them outside in the middle of the desert. And as we know, this is the sunnah of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu as well. We are taught that when we are seeking rain, Salatul Istisqa, we gather, preferably in the out open area, because that shows how destitute we are. That shows that we are all broken beggars in front of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and begging Allah for rain. So he does that, and he comes out and he says, "Ilahi, askin al ghayth." وانشر علينا رحمتك وارحمنا بالأطفال الرضع والبهائم الرطع والمشايخ الرقع Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he comes out leading a nation of 200,000 people and he raises his hands in the middle of this desert, in the middle of this drought of the greatest prophets of all time, the one who had the honor of speaking to Allah directly and he says, Oh Allah, Oh our God, grant us water for the sake of the starving breastfeeding children for the sake of the dying animals, for the sake of the bent over old men. There's people who really need this. And the narration mentions that, that this was one day before people started dying. This is it. If they don't get water now, people will start dying tomorrow. So Musa of the greatest prophets, performing what you're supposed to do in this situation, going out into the open, showing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how destitute and broken they are, how desperate they are in need. People are starving, all the boxes are checked out of when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers the dua. فَمَا زَادَتُ السَّمَاءُ إِلَّا تَقَشُّعًا وَالشَّمْسُ إِلَّا حَرَارًا The land only got drier and more cracked and the sun only got higher and hotter. The answer was no. Can you imagine? Everybody's been through a similar situation where you make dua, you pray a couple of rakahs tahajjud maybe, you put some money in the box, and then the first thing you do is you go the next morning to the shaykh, why didn't it work? I remember someone called me once and said, yesterday I was in the park for two to three whole hours listening to Quran. Why, don't, why doesn't my dua get answered? Of course, the first answer is like, well, what did that do even for you, let alone anybody else? Like, it's not a, but in, their, in our mind, I'm so virtuous. I've checked out all the boxes. The only reason it doesn't work, something's wrong with it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not keeping up his end. That's my first assumption. Right? Musa alayhi salam, he says, Ilahi wa Sayyidi, my master and my God. Hal khalaqa jahi? Is my, did I, where did I fall short? That's his first question. This is Musa alayhi salam. Is, did my, is, don't, I don't have enough reputation. I don't have pull with you. I don't have enough status with you. I'm not good enough to make this request. What am I doing wrong? That was his first check. What am I doing wrong? What can I do differently? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers him and says, مَا خَلُقَ جَاهُكْ عِنْدِي وَإِنَّكَ عِنْدِي وَجِيهِ You have high status with me. You're special. You have the greatest prophets. You did nothing wrong. That's not the problem. وَلَكِنْ فِيكُمْ عَبْدٌ يُبَارِزُنِي مُنْذَ أَرْبَعِينَ سَنَةٍ بِالْمَعَاصِي فَنَادِي فِي النَّاسِ حَتَّى يَخْرُجْ مِنْ بَيْنِي أَظْهُرِكُمْ There's one man amongst 200,000 who for the last 40 years has been insisting, has had the audacity to sin against me openly for the last 40 years. Kick him out and you get your water. Can you imagine? Out of 200,000, you could do the percentage real quickly. It's going to be like 0. 0.0 something. One person who's stopping it for everyone. He's the problem. So Musa A.S. stands. فَقَامَ مُنَادِيًا وَقَالْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْعَبْدُ الْعَصِي الَّذِي يُبَارِزُ اللَّهَ مُنْذَ أَرْبَعِينَ سَنَةٍ أُخْرُجْ مِنْ بَيْنِ أَظْهُرِنَا فَبِكَ مُنِعْنَا الْمَطَرِ he stands in front of a nation of 200,000 people and says, Oh, disobedient servant, Allah is calling you out. Get out so we don't die of thirst. Can you imagine? Imagine if a man, if there was an announcement that we heard right now outside of this masjid, that one individual here out of the hundred or so or less that are here is causing everyone to suffer. They are the worst amongst us. What would we do? What's the first order of business? How would, we, how would we figure it out? Huh? 
No, seriously. How do we, if we heard that announcement, how do we, what, would, what would we do next? Huh? Say it again. A test? Who would a test? Who is he? No, no, I'm saying if someone announced it now, not back then, now, that in this masjid there's one person who's the worst, which is the fact, right? There's, there's got to be one person who's the worst. What would we do? How would we figure it out? And he had to or she had to exit the crowd. Huh? Uh, uh, how's that help? Can the worst person please stand up? That works? There's another narration that um, uh, uh, a prophet of Bani Israel gathered his town and he told them, Eatuni bi khayrikum. So they produced for him a man. Give me the best of you. The best this town has to offer. And he said, I'm a prophet. I know. So you guys, I'm by giving you guys a chance to choose him. So they chose a man. And then they, they pushed him towards the prophet. He said, this is the man that we think is the best. So he told him, bisharrihim. Get me the worst of them. So the man thought for a second. And then he said, فَمَا وَجَدْتُ شَرٌ مِنِّي I'm here. I thought and I couldn't think of anyone worse. So the, man, the Prophet told him they were right the first time. It's a very interesting idea when you say, what would we do? Everyone thinks, how would we filter them out? No one thinks, what would I do? Because it's so far-fetched that I'll be the worst person amongst 20, let alone 50, let alone 200,000. Impossible. It can't be. But the fact of the matter is that everyone knows themselves. He stands up in front of this crowd and he announces and he calls out, O oh, sinner, for the last 40 years. Because the reality is you have a title with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is really who we are. Here you could be Mr. So-and-so, Abu so-and-so, Dr. so-and-so, Engineer so-and-so. So many titles and designations and different things that we give to each other. But in reality, there's a title of who we are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here this person is being called out. He has another name. He has an actual proper name. He has a title, maybe a kunya. But he's being called out. Ayyuhal Abdul Asi, sinner. 40 year sinner. You're killing us all. We need you to go because we're all dying. What would that sin be if someone announced it here? You can always tell because the second you start this conversation, your heart rate picks up a little bit. Your throat dries. You know, we all know. The problem is that we don't, it's not that we don't know, it's that we don't do better. We know better. So it would behoove all of us to consider. Is it my sin that's doing this to the community, to my family, to the ummah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الناس الناس Corruption, evil, has appeared at land and at sea. In the desert and in the cities. In the middle of nowhere, in the wilderness and where people live. All this is interpretations of these words. Every nook and cranny has been corrupted, polluted because of what people have done. I don't, I don't do anything. It's just a couple of pictures here and there. It's just a couple of words here and there. It has nothing to do with anyone. That's how we all think. You can never imagine that's cascading down to the entirety of the ummah killing everyone. But that's the reality. One man, 200,000. Tomorrow they will begin to drop like flies. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, get him out and you will have your water. He's stopping it all. Rasul sallallahu told us, مَثَلُ الْقَائِمِ عَلَى حُدُودِ اللَّهِ وَالْوَاقِعِ فِيهَا The example of the people who stay the line, they told the line regarding the prohibitions and commands of Allah. And those who dive in, those who don't care. It's like a group of people who take a journey on a boat. So some of them are on the deck and some of them are below. And when those below get thirsty, they say perhaps we can just make a small hole into the side that will affect no one instead of bothering those on top. And so if the people on top, he said, وسلم, let the people on the bottom do as they please, they will all die. Because it's going to be one drop and then another one hole will be that last hole that we all can't recover from. And the boat cannot be saved. We all drown. 
there's one person who's going to make that hole. He's not going to see it as that big of a deal, but it's going to be that hole, right? The straw that broke the camel's back. So the announcement being made is that you're the problem. It's all because we're all going to die because of you. The ummah is suffering, including its prophet, its leader, because of you. Get out so we can live. Can you imagine to stand in front of Allah? Forget here, in front of the people, the embarrassment and the shame and the guilt. But in front of Allah on the Day of Judgment, in front of all people, and being told it was you. The misery in Palestine, the occupation of Muslim lands, the lack of leadership, it can all be traced back to you. Your sin killed everybody. Can you imagine? What a miserable end. What a horrible end. But it's not the end. It's not the end of his story. And it's not the end of ours, inshallah. So he calls out and he says, sinning servant, get out so we can live, so we don't die. And this is all going through his head, as you can imagine. Everything we just said, it's all my fault. I'm going to be embarrassed in front of everyone. A nation of 200,000, it's prophet calling me out. So this is all going through his head. فَقَالَ فِي نَفْسِهِ إِنْ أَنَا خَرَجْتَ مِنْ بَيْنِ حَالَ الْخَلْقِ افْتَضَحْتُ عَلَى رُؤُوسِ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ وَإِنْ قَعَدْتُ مَعَهُمْ مُنِعُ لِأَجْلِي he, said, he thought to himself, he says, if I stand up now, everyone will see that it's me. They'll understand that this whole conundrum, the predicament that we're in, was because I had no shame for 40 years. Because I had the audacity to not worry about it for 40 years regarding my creator. To tell him not now, later. And here I am 40 years later, being the cause of all this for everyone. So I don't want that. But then again, he tells to himself, if I stay... They're being denied because of me. They will all die. So he's stuck in this very difficult situation. He doesn't want people to die. He's not enjoying the suffering. But he's, he's terrified of the shame and the embarrassment. He puts his head inside of his hood. Covers his face in shame. And he calls out, Ilahi wa Sayyidi, my master and my God. Asaytuka arba'ina sanatan wa amhaltayni. Wa qad ataytuka ta'i'an fa'aqbilni. For 40 years, I have disobeyed you. And yet, you have granted me reprieve. Up until now, I have not been exposed. And for that reason, I come to you today in obedience. What's he saying? I'm sorry. Go back to our analysis. The brother that was here, he stepped out. Is there a need that he has? It's the ultimate need. He's trying to save his own skin. Physically with the water so they don't die of thirst. And then emotionally so he doesn't get his spot blown up in front of 200,000 people. So he's, it's purely selfish, right? He's in it for himself. So does he need something? Of course, he needs it all. How about the sin itself? He's been repeating it for not once, not twice, for the last four decades, an entire lifetime. He's not really sorry, is he? Would you consider him sorry? Would you accept my apology if I did something two, three times in a row, let alone 40 years straight? You wouldn't. I wouldn't either. None of us would. In terms of, in terms of the deed itself, dripping with insincerity, the apology. The need he has is a personal one, not to be embarrassed, not to die of thirst. Even what he presents, what does he present? Nothing. He says, oh Allah, my bad. That is all that he did. So it doesn't check out any box for me or for you. In fact, the very statement would probably tick us off. Someone in this predicament came to you and said, I'm sorry, we would be so aggravated by the apology itself. There, something has to give. There's no way that's it. There's no way that's all you're going to do and then it's a, we're done here for 40 years. But, but the, the story says, the hadith says, فَمَسْتَتَمُّ الْكَلَامُ حَتَّى الْتَفَعَتْ سَحَابَ فَأَمْطَرَتْ كَأَفْوَاءِ الْقُرَبِ Before he finished the sentence, before he gets to the end of the words, they are shaded by a cloud. And I've lived in the desert for five years. When the cloud would come, I remember once I went home and I, 
speaking to my wife how excited I was to see a cloud. And she said, are you okay? Is everything all right? She didn't see that when you live in Saudi Arabia or any desert country, we pass 10 months without a single cloud in the sky. When it appears, it's something to look at. It's a sight. You smile at it because you haven't seen one in 10 months over 300 days where the cloud is just blazing sun. So when it appears, everyone notices. The students tell the professor, can we have a day off? It's cloudy today. So in the middle of the desert, before he finishes his sentence, before the words are completed, they are covered by a sudden cloud. 200,000 people in the desert. And it doesn't start to rain. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the rain begins to pour like out of the mouths of jugs. They're completely drenched in water from this one sentence, this one apology. Musa Alayhi Salaam is confused. He calls out, Ilahi wa Sayyidi, my God and my master. Where did we get this water from? No one exited. We didn't expose him. We didn't kick him out as we were supposed to. He's still there. How were we saved, O oh Allah? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers him, Saqaytukum billadhi bihi manatukum. I granted you water through the same one whom I originally denied you. Can you imagine standing in front of Allah on the day of judgment and finding out you were the solution all along? That that day that you made tawbah, everything changed for you, for your family, for the community, for the whole ummah. You were that first domino. Why not? It, it worked the other way, didn't it? It worked the other way where his sin almost killed everyone. And then it saved everyone. When he changed his mind and said, I'm sorry. Why can't it be me and you? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave a prostitute in the middle of the desert, where no one sees that apology, no one cares. Not, the dog can't even intellectually fathom it or accept it. But he sees that apology. It's all about what does it mean to you. If it is sincere, if it's you really putting your foot down, really sorry, then before you get to the why, Allah forgives you. Before you get to the end of the sentence. He says before he finished his words, the rain started to pour. That's all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for us to come back sincerely. He's not holding it back. The same ayah that we said earlier. He's not holding it back for torment's sake, for punishment's sake. The corruption has appeared in land and at sea. Because of what people have done. Why? So that they can come back. So that they can wake up. It's just an alarm clock. The problem is that we keep hitting snooze. That's the problem. So each ring gets a little louder. Gets a little more violent. A little less comfortable. A lot harder to deal with. But that's only because we keep slamming the snooze button. But the reality is all it's going to take is one determined moment to change everything. You may not see it. It may not be as epic as jugs of water coming out in the desert from the sky. But it's there. You will be that first domino. And you will find out on the day of judgment that you were the first undoing of a chain. A link in a chain that kept millions and billions of Muslims underwater. But you were the first one to say, I'm done with this. This isn't comfortable. It's cold and it's dark down here and I don't like it. So you undid yours. You swam to the surface and people saw you and they followed. And you were rewarded for all of that. It changed everything. So very often we can't fathom that. There's no way that my personal little sin at home is affecting anyone. It's not true. We're all in this together. The reality is that we're on one boat. Some people are casting you know, the oars and the lines and trying to figure it out and trying to stay the course. And there's some people underneath the deck saying, I'm thirsty, it's just one hole. And one of them may kill us all. One of them will be that last hole that the boat couldn't take. These mentalities, they change the way that we... If you have this mentality, you put this in front of your eyes, it changes your perception. It changes how you approach sins. It changes the strength people's arguments have when they say, come on, it's just one time. Just hang out. It's not that big a deal. Then you say, no, 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 it's huge. This is murder. I'm killing two billion people when I agree with you, when I agree with what you want to do. That's how I look at it. It's that serious. Changes the mentality. And when you come, it's not just my salah. It's not just two rakahs in the message. It's not just one talk. I'm saving the entire ummah. I'm being that superhero. 
on the very least for me and my family, but very quite possibly for everyone. It happened to this guy. Why not you? Right? Why is this so unreachable, so impossible? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him it was through the same one who I denied you initially that I now grant you water. So Musa is still not satisfied. He says, Ilahi wa Sayyidi, my God and my master. Arini al abd al Show me that righteous servant. Just two seconds ago, he said, Oh sinner, get out. You're killing us all. Now he's saying, Oh Allah, show me this superstar. It's really the difference of an instant of sincerity. One tear, one moment for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes your entire identity. So he says, Show me this obedient servant of yours. Show me this superstar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers him, Ya Musa, inni lam afdahu wa huwa yasini, afdahu wa huwa yuti'uni. Oh Musa, I didn't blow up his spot when he was disobeying me actively. Why would I do it to him now when he's changed his life around? It's none of your business who he is. He did this, this was between me and him. It's going to stay in that fashion. Ya Musa, inni abghidu nammameen, fakayfa akunu nammaman. O oh Musa, I despise gossipers. How then can you ask me to gossip? SubhanAllah, look at this, the ending of the, of the story. It's very, very interesting. And even though it is not an authentic hadith, a lot of the scholars say it drips with the prophetic formula, which is touching on so many different things. Your personal relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the concept of an ummah, different acts of worship, and then finally ending with manners. The mo one of the most important things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, this is gossip. You don't need this information, Musa. So by me sharing with you information about someone else that you don't need, that automatically becomes gossip. Why would I do that when I'm the one who hates and punishes gossipers? So for us here is a very important tidbit, a small, nice little point. Then what's the Islamic definition of gossip? Information about anyone that does not need to be mentioned. Period. He has black hair. If it did not need to be mentioned in this gathering, it's considered gossip. And it can lead to haram potentially. Right? Especially if it's causing any type of rift between people. But the, the, the most basic of that definition is given here, which is information that no one needs to know. So it's, it's quite an amazing concept to consider as a mindset. That was the point of what I wanted to do here. Maybe the solutions of the ummah, maybe their way forward, their progression, is in the shade of my tawbah or in the shade of your tawbah. Maybe the ummah is waiting day in and day out hoping for you to change your life around. They just don't know it and neither do you. But the day that it happens, something will change for everyone. This is not far-fetched, right? The Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said this about the Mahdi, right? Who is the Imam? يَأْتِي عَلَىٰ آخِرِ الزَّمَانِ Comes at the end of time. Who يَمْلَأُ الْأَرْضِ عَدْلًا He will fill the earth with justice. The same way that it was previously filled with injustice. He will undo all the wrongs. He will fix all the problems. He will lead the world, the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, and the world as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended it as Islam was meant to be. That will happen at the end of time. There's a lot of hadith about him. One of them tells us that he is a normal person. Quote unquote. He's just the average Joe. Or in this case, average Mo, right? Because he's Muslim. He has no type of... He's not like some superstar imam, super righteous that leads people. He is a normal person. يَهْدِيَهُ اللَّهُ فِي لَيْلَةً Allah guides him overnight. He changes his life around. And the entire ummah changes after him. So it's also another thing about this concept. The scholars say it's not always one man. It could be partial. It could be the tawbah of these 50. The effort of this community propelled the Muslim ummah forward. That's the story of Al-Ansar. That's the story of Ahl Badr. A few hundred, a handful of people amongst tens of thousands whose sincerity and piety passed the threshold to change the world. So we could be waiting on just you, we could be waiting on ten of us. Either way, the attitude never changes. It is dire, it's go time, right? There is no overtime. We can't bank in on some other team coming in and tagging in and picking up the mess. None of these attitudes are will get us there. We're all in this together. As a final reminder, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where he said, مثل القائم على حدود الله والواقع فيها كمثل قوم استهموا على سفينة فأصاب بعضهم أعلاها وبعضهم أسفلها 
فكان الذين في أسفلها إذا استقوا من الماء مروا على من فوق على من فوقهم فقالوا لو أن خرقنا في نصيبنا خرقا ولم نؤذي من فوقنا فإن يتركوهم وما أرادوا هلكوا جميعا وإن أخذوا على أيديهم نجوا ونجوا جميعا The example of those who care, those who are upright regarding the parameters of Allah. They toe the line that Allah has drawn and those who could care less are like the example of two groups of people who journey together on a boat. So half of them stay on top at the deck and the other half go to the bottom. And when the group on the bottom become thirsty, they say, let us not annoy those on top. The water is right here. All we have to do is make a small hole in the hull. So he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the people on top, leave them to their desires, they will all die. And if the people on top take their hands and prevent them, they will all be saved. So the attitude that we must have is we are all in it together and we have no time. We have no luxury to sit on it. We all got to get to work as soon as possible. And we trust in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that overnight He could change everything. He could forgive it all and He could make us better than we ever imagined. There's a lot more stories of people whose tawbah changed everything in an epic fashion. But I think we'll cut it here, inshallah. If we look in Islamic history, we'll see plenty of people, starting from the Sahaba themselves, Umar ibn Khattab. Right? The Sahaba said his Islam changed everything. The day he became Muslim, everything changed. Was he stronger, stronger than Rasulullah No. Was he stronger than Hamza? No, but he came with a bang. He came in, and the day he became Muslim, he said, Oh Rasulullah, why are we praying here in a house hidden? Let's go pray at the Kaaba. And then everything changed, and it never went back to what it was before. Likewise, so many scholars throughout history, that the day that they changed their lives around, they didn't start as righteous people. Abdullah ibn Mubarak, Fudayl ibn Ayyad, and so many others. Some of them started as party goers, drunkards, thieves. And they changed their lives around, became scholars that until today, over a millennia later, we can't help but quote their works and reference their stories. The entirety of the deen comes from them. So you don't ever belittle not just the sin that you're doing, but the effect of the tawbah that the tawbah will have on you and others around you, inshallah. I hope it was beneficial. I hope it was enjoyable. Jazakumullah khairan for your attentiveness. If there are any questions, inshallah, I'll be more than happy to address them. Uh, other than that, jazakumullah khairan, everyone. Any questions, comments? Feedback, concerns. Change how you think about apologies. The, um, every, everything in existence, everything that exists is the opposite. That's why I started with, what do you guys think? How would you reject an apology? Because the apology that, was, that Allah accepted in this story and that Allah always accepts is not one that means you would accept. So that teaches us something, which is you should be more forgiving. The hadith tells us this directly that, you know, you have mercy on those on earth, the one in the heavens will have mercy on you. Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself says, Would you not love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives you? And this story is a crazy story, right? This is the story of Abu Bakr and his cousin Mistah, who was one of the key people who's spreading the rumor about Aisha anha committing zina, right? So look at the levels. It's the daughter of Abu Bakr, the wife of Rasulullah he's accusing her of zina and spreading this falsely amongst people. And there's one crazy layer on top of this. His entire life is off of Abu Bakr's sadaqah. He's poor. So Abu Bakr is, and Abu Bakr is his cousin. How many levels of betrayal? You're betraying your cousin, who you're living off of his sadaqah. You're cursing his daughter, who's married to the messenger of Allah. Right? So it's like, there's no level of, there's no leeway to make it okay. So Abu Bakr says, you are going to starve. Never given to give you another penny. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals, أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ وَلَا يَأْتَلِي أُلُّ الْفَضْلِ مِنْكُمْ That ayah which is, don't let the people who have the blessings and the bounty and the opportunity and the, the extra that Allah gave them, they shouldn't hold back because of what others do. Don't, wouldn't you like that Allah forgives you? So when he heard that verse, he said, yes, I would. I would love that Allah forgives me. And I forgive him and I'll spend on him until he dies and he did. So levels, there's levels to forgiveness. Human beings naturally, you can never forget. 
There's no, no matter what you do, no matter how good our relationship, no matter how much you present me with money and favors and good words, I can never forget what you've done. It'll always be there, lingering, human nature. We're extremely cheap with it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never forgets and it doesn't matter because it's as if you've never done it. So everything that causes people not to forgive, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has it more and He still forgives. So in terms of the need, Everyone needs Allah in totality. Well, he needs nothing and he still forgives. Well, if someone needed me and I'd say, you're just saying sorry because you need me. In terms of who has the right to commit that mistake, we can argue about it. You had the right against me, I had the right against you and it'll be always differed. But with Allah, does anyone ever have the right to commit against Allah anything? Never, the least. In fact, he gave you everything that you're using to commit against him. So none of it checks out and he still forgives. He doesn't benefit a single thing from forgiving. Well, even if I have all the needs of the world, all the money, all the property, I still get that good feeling like I forgave someone. So I'm still benefiting something. But with Allah, He gets absolutely nothing. So all the reasons not to forgive apply to Allah even greater. And yet He forgives the most. Mind-boggling. That's why He's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why He's Al-Ghafur Rahim. That's why we're doing all this, right? That's why we know we have somewhere to turn, somewhere to look forward to, something to seek out in all that we're doing. So, it's, it's a, definitely an eye-opening lesson when you compare the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the forgiveness of the creation. So if there's no other questions or comments, inshallah, we will go ahead, Baba. <laughs> I have to. <laughs> So he, he, he was sincere, yeah. Saying for us, we would, we would consider it insincere. But with Allah, Allah knows he was sincere. He had the regret. He had the shame. He vowed never to do it again. And, and the hadith that you mentioned, which is, the Prophet ﷺ said, people can spend a whole lifetime doing the actions of the people of the hellfire. And then all the way at the end, Allah will have mercy on them and they turn around. And the opposite is true as well. And this hadith, one of the reasons we have it is, never write yourself off. Never say that's it, I'm done. I remember that one time I was speaking to a student and we were speaking, you know, lesson about mercy, forgiveness of Allah. And he said, I don't think Allah will ever forgive me. I've done too much. And I was shocked that he said this because he was 12 years old. <laughs> so I was like, what did you do? Like, come on. I'm, no, no, no. Usually when people say I've done too much, I say, just pray for forgiveness. Allah forgives everything. I don't need to know what you've done between you and Allah. This one, I was like, no, 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 no. Let me hear it. What have you done? Like, I'm ready to hear as bad as it got. Like, you really piqued my interest that you think you've gone too far at this age like you know whatever at this point you know, I really wonder what he's done I never, I never did find out but the point is he, he, there's that mentality exists with a lot of people I know Allah and some of them will, will, will they say I know Allah will forgive me and can I'm just ashamed to come back it doesn't make sense anymore That's, you're still saying the same thing right so the hadith tells us no you can get to that doorstep of death after a lifetime of evil just like this man all it takes is one sincere moment. All, you seriously have to turn your life around. It's not just a statement that he made. He said, I'm done. Oh Allah, from this moment I'm done. And he meant it. He was really done. So Allah said, that's all I need to hear. It's all, it's all it is. That's all you have to say. And before the words were completed, it was accepted. So that is the message for sure. It was sincere. And it, it is a, a reminder for all of us. It is a call for all of us to, to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly and never write ourselves off. But my, my analysis of his apology as insincere was from the human perspective. If, we look, if someone did this and it was me, would you accept it or consider it sincere? No, but of course it was, Allah accepted it because it was sincere. We would write these things off. We would say, no way. I can see right through it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at things differently and considers it uh, and still accepts it because it is sincere. He doesn't have the same rubric as we do. We're a lot stingier with our acceptance of apologies. We're a lot more hesitant. We're a lot more analytical of what we get out of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't do that. If it's sincere, that is the only box that needs to be checked. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
grant us a sincere tawbah constantly every moment of our lives, especially before we die, and not, ex and not decree death for us except that we are in the most pleasing state to Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, hamdik, ashadu na ilan, tastaghfiru wa tawbu alayk, wa sallam wa baraka Sayyidina Muhammad, wa alayhi wa sallam. Jazakum al khair, and everyone, wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.